Steve Jobs is still teaching after all these years. This is The Focus Group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Focus Group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with my good friend and co-host, Mr. John T. Nash. Be sure to join us here every Wednesday. You can find us on our live stream with YouTube and or through Facebook Live. And, of course, you can find everything at focusgroupradio.com, including our podcast, which is TFG Unbuttoned. Don't confuse the two. Uh, one's 20 minutes and one's about 40 minutes. But we were happy to say we're in the top 1%, John, of the 3 million available podcasts. 3 million globally. There's podcasts out there. I was happy to say we were in the top. We are in the top 1%. We're also in the top 100 marketing and business uh, podcasts out there in 2021, according to another study. And do you want to guess what country we're number one in? You know, you sent me a note, <clears throat> so I would be cheating, but... Um, oh, did you know? Yeah, you did see it. Which, were you surprised? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you share that with everyone? So apparently we're tops in South Africa and Ghana. So I thought maybe we should be looking, maybe South African Airlines or maybe Ghana's big with chocolate and cocoa, and maybe we should get sponsors out of there. I just don't know how that um, how that works. Like, how are we that popular over there? Well, when I but when I look at the analytics, it's obviously the United States is is by far the largest listener group, and then followed by either the UK or Canada, um, as you would imagine. The first time something comes up that's not uh, English speaking would be uh, South Korea. For some reason, we're very big. Um, France. I thought we'd be big in France. Japan. J just for our 80s roots, right? <laughs> you know, you would think Japan, but not not so much Japan as much as South Korea. And uh, then Australia. Um, and uh, for a while, when when Pooty Poot had shut down in February, when he went and stormed into Ukraine on his mission, um, and it might have been because of all the shutdown of, of computers or whatever the access was he was doing there, but we were big in Russia, Poland, and Romania. That was only for a month. So I don't know if people were using us to get through or what was happening, but it's it's very <laughs> odd to look at. It's very odd to look at the analytics because uh, some odd things pop up. Yes, so. yes, like that. And right. and the top one hundred for business and um, entertainment shows is that um, something that is like global or is that just the U.S.? <clears throat> um. Good question. I'll have to dip, dig deeper into it. We were, you know, I think it was global because it was the same study. Essentially, it said you need to listen to these top uh, 100 business and marketing podcasts, and we were listed in there. Um, I'll we, I'll weren't, look, we weren't number I'll one, but it. we were in the I'm top not 100. Happy, I'll take it. Yeah, which I which I was pleasantly surprised considering you and I talk about a lot of nonsense <clears throat> sometimes before just strict. We're not a strict business. You know, if you look at some of these, it's. You know, who's the guy, you know, Kramer from uh, CNBC or whatever, yeah. Mad Money, all those. So obviously they're celebrities sort of um, folks talking about business. But um, you and I are just uh, more observers, I would say, at times. So, mm -hmm. And we throw a lot of other nonsense in along the way, as you used to say. Who Didn't, your, didn't one of your relatives tell you that? Oh, it was my mom's husband. It was uh, business, marketing, and some nonsense in between. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes more nonsense than others. So. Yeah, sometimes, yeah. No, it wasn't a bad... Uh, here's an oddball <clears throat> oddball hit for you that I saw on Queer Tea the other day. Um, and it came out of... Uh, I think it was in... Is it Seattle? A, uh, I should have put a picture up, but a, um, someone took a picture of a dumpster... Mm. that was painted in the colors of the rainbow. It was a pride dumpster. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> we had actually had that on our website. Did you really? Yeah. Okay, so someone qu commented. It says, we are not trash, never were trash, and never will be trash. And I just thought to myself, I don't think that was the intent because the paint job was actually very nice. It wasn't kind of some sloppy thing. But, I mean... It's an odd object to do rainbow on, don't you think? Dumpster? Well, I had posted it in June on our Facebook page because I thought it was odd too, but it was interesting the way people looked at it. So people felt that it was 
degrading. I looked at it as the, the absurdity of everything getting rainbowed. Yeah, there, that's that, where I would. That's that, where I would fall. That's yeah. how I looked at it. I'm like, oh my god, they're even now going to rainbow the dumpster. But people took it to mean, oh, we're trash. We're this. I didn't take it like that at all. So then I ended up taking it down. So you might not have seen it because I just thought, here we go again with all the wokeness, all the nonsense of. It, it, I just thought it was funny that there was a rainbow dumpster. I didn't read into it that. Same here. I didn't read into it a thing. I read. I I saw it and I thought, what. I wonder what the decision-making process that went into that. It could be the same decision-making process that goes into deciding that a fire hydrant could be a rainbow, rainbow. hydrant. Well, it's a lot How of work you? too, right? You got to get all those colors. Yeah, you got to paint it. You know, it's not oh, it was, like you just paint it green or red or blue or something. It's, it's it was not a sloppy paint job. No, the lines were perfect. <laughs> Maybe I'll post it again. See if it gets people stirred up. So I mean, I'll put the dumpster back on. <laughs> on, our, uh, on our homepage, I don't know the what's master there now. of all things website. I'll put the dumpster our, back up. Our, I don't, you know, that's a good question. I don't know what's on our homepage now. Oh, for a while Facebook. there, you had that. You know, the homepage had the picture of us in front of the Sirius Studios with Katie and James. Oh, that's what it, that still is. Yeah, that's still yeah, is. What yeah, it's and uh, okay. and James, of course, has gone on to other fames, right? Only fans. Only yeah. fan fames. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I <laughs> Many sales are being run there, by the way. 50% off. Really? Prices are dropping. Well, you know, there's a lot of that content floating around, right? Well, it's gotten more competitive, right? You had to get on that ball quick. You know, when, yes. when you know, it'd be like you and I now throwing out an OnlyFans and, <coughs> you know, trying Here, to I'm going to throw a word out for you that everybody went crazy for back when it came out. Do you remember Periscope? Yeah, but what was that? That was video streaming. It was an early version of TikTok or whatever. And I remember everybody had to be on Periscope. I remember Frank and Doria used to do a Periscope thing once Did a week really? or twice a week. Remember that? Mm -hmm. There was one influencer, quote unquote, which is really just word of mouth people. But there was one influencer that was on TikTok excited about it. He got his first check. So he's got 100,000 listeners or whatever. He does these videos every day, which I thought we could do. But then I looked at the check. He posted the check. It was fifty eight dollars and ninety nine cents, <laughs> but um, that's not even the electric bill. Okay, so but you know, there's that traveling bum kid that we saw. You know, he's building a home in East Hampton. Really? So, but his his sites have been taken down. Have they been taken down? So I don't. Know, hopefully, he collected his millions of dollars and is building his house, and we'll find something else to do. But you know, a lot of these sites have been getting have. Uh, they're, he's not allowed to show his bum anymore. You know, he was having these people go around and show their butts in different places around the world. Remember, uh -huh. traveling bum. But I thought, you know, it was like that you know, nurse Tim, that this was making the, the hundred thousand. We're going to be talking about this uh, as our week continues. This, I've been observing this with mild amusement. Everybody jumps on a bandwagon. Traveling bum. Let's do media kits. Let's buy media with traveling bum. Boom, gone. Yep. Periscope, 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 gone. Facebook, I don't know if you've seen the Wall Street Journal or any of the, the business news, but uh, Facebook's stock price is cratering. They claim that users are fleeing the platform, and by users, they usually mean 18 to 34-year-olds. Yeah. <clears throat> Everybody else is still using it. Um, and, and ever since Apple instituted um, more privacy features in their iOS system, the drop off in revenue ad revenue has been pretty horrific for Facebook. So well, what do you stopped, want to we've bet? Stopped, we've stopped advertising on it. Yeah, and it's, what do you want useless. to bet? Gonna, but media buyers and people that we talk to about mm -hmm. getting show, getting sponsors for our show, all they want are numbers. How many likes do you have on Facebook? I like toilet paper. That doesn't mean I'm going on. I buy Scott's tissue usually. I don't normally buy Charmin, but maybe I thought Charmin had a funny ad, so I might like it. Does that mean I bought Charmin? No. No. It's just crazy. Well, it was uh, the old adage of when we worked at Volkswagen, we worked with Volkswagen, and uh, the Passat was the number one rated Super Bowl commercial because they did the huge online Darth thing Vader. with Star Wars. Yeah. The cars, they had to stop making the car because they didn't sell them. So um, you can get six million, yep. 600 million, whatever the number of likes, click, click, click. I went f through Facebook the other day and looked at all the things that I had liked that I've never, ever engaged in again. Yeah, I was shocked about some of the things. You know, somebody sends you this. Oh, like you know, moms who have kitties, and you go, oh, okay, quick. But um, <laughs> kitty on a Roomba, like <laughs> right. It doesn't mean you're ever going to engage in it again, or ever go back there again or look at it. I think I liked J Crew or something. Yeah, I've never gone there again to look at what they're doing on Facebook. 
if I want to buy something, I go to the actual website. Yep. But, no, you're absolutely right. It, it'll be interesting to see how these things are, but you're right. Everyone wants to measure, and it's a simple, lazy buy. It's like buying football on a Sunday. The media buyers want to do it because they can spend a lot of money, and it supposedly gets a lot of eyeballs. What's your return on investment? I don't know. Oh, but it's Tim, an easy said, buy. For anybody listening, uh, Tim, I, you probably you might have heard our this particular story a couple times, but you know, Tim told me a story once about Nielsen ratings and about how we measure this stuff. And <clears throat> one day, Tim says to me, he goes, "Ford runs an ad, a thirty second spot in the third quarter or the second quarter of a game. How many trucks did they sell? Who knows, right?" right? If you knew that, you'd win the Nobel Peace Prize. Because there you that's go. A, the, the CFO at Subaru used to always ask those sort of questions. Well, how many did we sell over the weekend? I said, we had a good weekend, but we also had about 35 other things going on. So the what's the old adage? How can you that parse sort That it? Wanamaker said, right? I, I know I waste half of my money in advertising. I just don't know which half. Which half, yeah. And uh, so whether it's events or whether it's a direct mail or whether it's radio, print, out of home, whatever, the combination did well for the weekend. But I can't pinpoint something specifically and say oh there it is yeah exactly so, anyway so the way our show works we john and i do our banter at f at the frontier and then uh we'll do a caught my eye and then a uh a sponsor uh one of our sponsors deep discount will be um with us today and we'll talk about what we found there and they have a biography sale going on and then after we take a quick break we have a business birthday and then we'll do a shop talk which this week involves steve jobs <laughs> so, Mr. Nash, what uh, what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Well, I don't want to uh, leverage the hurricane, but there were moments of levity as a little bit before it made landfall and during that period down in Florida, and it has to do with news broadcasters. So, an uh, eagle-eyed viewers noticed that one of the uh, people reporting from <laughs> oh, 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 the no. scene of the hurricane had a plastic covering over the microphone that she was using, and it happened to indeed be a condom. So the headline is, Florida reporter wraps mic in condom, quote, safe hurricane reporting. <clears throat> <laughs> reporting in a hurricane is dangerous business, and it's important for journalists to protect themselves and their gear. A savvy reporter caught viewers' attention on Wednesday for doing just that, as she reported on Hurricane Ian near Naples with a condom over her microphone. WBBH-TV's Kyla Gaylor cleared the air on her Instagram story after baffled social media users wondered what they were seeing. <laughs> it is what you think it is, Gaylor said. It's a condom. It helps protect the gear. We can't get these mics wet. There's a lot of wind, a lot of rain, so we got to do what we got to do, and that, that is put a condom on the microphone. Another local journalist, Jeff Patera of WZVN-TV in Naples, chimed in to help his colleague field questions about the technique. We practice safe hurricane reporting, he gipped. Yes, it's a condom. Nothing better to waterproof a mic. Oh, my So um, I just smiled at it because I thought ingenuity is the mother. What is it? Um, is it what's the mother of ingenuity the mother is the mother of invention? Invention, right. Yeah. So two things. I wonder if it was lubricated because that would have a heart rate. Right? And God, and why, let's hope not. Yeah. And why the reservoir tip? I think you, you think she should have because the picture you're showing. It's obvious what it is, and she got her mouth up. She'll have her mouth up to it. I wonder why she didn't. She decided to use the reservoir. Maybe that's all they could find. I think you Occam's razored that one perfectly. The simplest explanation must be, in fact, be the correct one, and that is that that might be all they could find. It. It does. <laughs> there is another wrinkle here that I thought about. Did they run to a CVS or something to get this, or did someone pull it out of their pocket? So here, I put this on the mic. Can't yeah. get it wet. And is that a rubber band down by her hand? I thought maybe it wasn't yes. tight. So there must have been a Magnum yeah. or something. They're using. I don't know. I'm, I'm just <laughs> guessing brand. <laughs> I didn't want it loose at the bottom. So I, there you go. That's my simple caught my eye. I don't eyes. even know how I go on I, how we go beyond this, John. I mean, this is just probably one of the best caught my eyes in a Well, this market. follows up last week's where I had the woman who swallowed 55 batteries. Yeah. By the way, we we heard that in the car coming home on Sunday. I had not told Bob the story. I just looked over at him as I start talking about it and he always waits for your laugh. And then he goes crazy. So he, he he hears me read this thing about 50, and then you hear, oh, my, you hear you, you saying, oh, my God, you start laughing. And then Bob goes, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Those batteries, yeah, that was nasty. 
Yeah, so condom, condom on a mic. Condom on a mic's a good one. I can't top that, but I, I picked a story that I saw that came from CNN, and I laughed because I've experienced this myself while in the great state of California. So the headline is, you will soon be able to jaywalk ticket-free in California. So Californians will soon be able to cross the street outside of a formal intersection without being ticketed, as long as it's safe to do so. Governor Gavin Newsom signed the Freedom to Walk Act <laughs> into law on Friday. <laughs> and this was sponsored by Assembly member Phil Ting, who wrote that the law stipulates that pedestrians can only be ticketed for jaywalking or crossing outside of an intersection if there's an immediate danger of a collision. The new law will take effect on January 1st. Ting says the reason he did this was not because of uh, safety or because of uh, empty streets, which we've often encountered in California. He says um, he felt that the, the people that were getting ticketed for jaywalking were predominantly black pedestrians or homeless people. So he, he thought it was a racist policy. So that's why he brought this forward. But I, it caught my eye because there are many times I, uh, we would stay in Santa Monica and I would go yep. for a run early in the morning at 5, 5.30 or go to get coffee at 6.30. And the streets are empty there. And people were standing at traffic lights. I mean, you could see for miles and miles and miles. We're in a car around. And they would wait three or five minutes for the light to change. And one time, I think, John, you and I actually were there and we went across and people yelled at us and you turned around and said, we're, we're from back east in New York City. We don't have time to waste it. Waste time at an empty street crosswalk. Remember, I, I think I you... do remember that. And we were going to that restaurant that you had always liked for brunch. It right. Was, um... and, and everybody was mortified yeah. that you and I were crossing. There wasn't a car a million miles around. <laughs> and you're like, you're like, we don't have time to waste waiting for to cross an empty street. That's what I always love about New York, right? You're in there, boom, you got things to go, places to do. Same with in Philly, because Rehoboth here is guilty of that. People will stand and wait. Not a thing around. <laughs> Cross so the freaking the, street. The idea of a jaywalking law is that we don't have the ability to decide for ourselves if we're like in harm's way. Is that right? Yeah. So California's finally caught up with the rest of the world. But I just, as I said, I remember that because you and I had encountered that. And I'd get frustrated because I thought, okay, should I stay here? And the people in California would give you such a dirty look. And I got to the point where I just didn't care. I would cross um, because that's what you do. I, I would say Boston, Philly, New York. DC, right? If you see it, if you see an N, you take it. You get across the street. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And I do. Do you remember the name of that place? It was a brunch place, a breakfast place we went to. It was blue and white. Blue plate, and blue moon, blue. Blue something. And blue they had cafe. amazing French toast and they had great eggs. And we went there when we walked from our hotel one morning. And you're right. I remember like there's nothing. It was like it was a yeah. It was this no cars existed and and people were just standing. And we're like I'm looking around. You know, oh, the people don't do that here. They don't cross like you're a New Yorker. Yeah, no, it was it was ridiculous. Um, yeah, I don't remember. I think it was called Blue Plate. It was the name of it. Blue Plate. Yeah, here it is. Blue Plate, Santa Monica. So it's still there. Uh, closed. Oh. <laughs> a favorite Santa Monica neighborhood favorite. Blue Blue Plate served its last meal August thirteenth. Uh, restaurant first opened in 99, ended in 18-year run. Da, 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 da. Yeah, it's closed. Did it make it through pandemic, I guess? Uh, no. It, uh, uh, that's let's why. Let's see. It closed. Well, it says August 13th, but it looks like this was done in 2017, so pre-pandemic. Oh, pre. okay. Okay. That was a shame. That was a great, that was a fun place, and you had discovered that. Yeah. No, it was good. It was It was like something you, you would have seen maybe in Hudson, it felt like, yep. right? Yep. You know, up in, uh, up in your area there. So, yeah, so that you can, you can jaywalk now in California. <laughs> and put a condom over a mic. Put yeah. a condom <laughs> over a mic, which I like that one. So, hey, as most of you know, uh, Deep Discount has been a partner of ours here since we've uh, gone to our video cast and our, uh, and our uh, audio as well. But uh, you can get to them by going to focusgroupradio.com and clicking on the Deep Discount logo. You start shopping away. They always have great sales going on. We just finished up our Criterion Month last month, which John is getting the discs ready to send out. And uh, so they have a biography sale going on now. And uh, lots of great films from that genre. Mr. Nash, did you find anything in particular? You want yep. to update before people I give on you the my Criterion? Pick, um, for Criterion Month, as we each week we'll tell you what the clue was from the previous month's first week. So the first week of Criterion Month in September for a deep discount, many of you did get this correct. It was uh, 12 Angry Men. 
featuring Henry Fonda. A couple of people thought it might have been To Kill a Mockingbird because of the similarities to uh, Gregory Peck's voice. Um, But it was Henry Fonda and 12 Angry Men. And and those came flooding in. I'm like, wow, either I made the clues too simple or we have a lot of movie buffs. I'll go with movie buffs. (laughs) So for biography... um, I picked a movie that I've actually seen that I think I highly recommend, and it's called Scotty and the Secret History of Hollywood. And the reason oh, I thought I about this- Oh, I love that one. Was because I saw a documentary on the making of Forbidden Planet, a, movie, a, a great sci-fi film from the, the 50s. And it starred Walter Pigeon. And Walter Pigeon actually plays a key role in this Scotty and the Secret History of Hollywood, because he used to go to this gas station that Scotty Bowers, is that his name? Yeah, Scotty Bowers, used to work at. And Scotty, uh, was a World War, War II vet, handsome and pers- personable Midwest farm boy, settles in L.A. after the war, and basically settled into a decades-long career covertly procuring, when not himself providing, I like that little parenthetical, sexual services to the women and men of the Hollywood elite. This eye-opening name-naming take on Bowers' 2012 memoir offers copious access to its now 95-year-old subject. And if any of you saw... Um, Ryan Murphy's Hollywood on Netflix. There was a gas station in there and all the attendants had to dress a certain way and they're all like handsome guys. That's kind of a direct reference to Scotty Bauer. So my recommendation for biography would be Scotty and the Secret History of Hollywood. You know, our friend Lauren at uh, Deep Discount Marketing Director turned me onto this, turned us both onto it and I'm so glad she did because it's a really, it's a fun watch. Yep. I um I, I've selected one which I think I've talked about before because I love the book uh, Into the Wild, and you can get it on DVD at deep discount for uh, seven dollars and fourteen cents, which, which is a great deal. Uh, stars Emily Hirsch, Marcia Gay Harden, uh, William Hurt, uh, Christine Stewart, Hal Holbrook, which uh, actually got a uh, Academy Award for uh, for co-starring and Vince Vaughn, as well as a number of others, directed by Sean Penn. It's about a kid who uh, graduates college from an upper middle class uh, family. His name is Christopher McCandless. And uh, John Krakauer actually wrote the bestseller. But he was 22 years old. He graduates college and drops out of society and decides he's going to hitchhike from Maryland out to Alaska. And it um, shows what happens along the way. So he gives up phones, gives up um, any sort of technology, money, everything, and just tries to make money going across the country and ends up in Alaska. Sadly, finds out that um, really life is not about being lonely. It's about having connections and being with people. But by time, uh, he realizes that tragedy has uh, ensued. So it, it doesn't end very well. But Tim, this was released in 2017, right? Yes. No, no, 2007. I'm sorry, it was re-released in 2017. Yeah. 2007. You said it was John Krakauer? Right. He was the original person who, um, and he used to write for Outside Magazine, but John Krakauer does a lot of these, I don't know what the right word is. You know, he did one about uh, Mount Everest. Did he do the Perfect Storm? He did Storm? one about, um, I don't know if he did Perfect Storm, but he did Mount Everest. He did one about the Mormon. Mormon ah, Earth. yes, yes, yes. Got it. Thank you. Yep. And um, and it was ver- very well written to the point where it was one of the few books that I remember it was so well written. I had such a visual. There's a there's a scene where um, where McCandless is working on a farm, and I believe it's Nebraska or somewhere in the in the the, the breadbasket of the U.S. And it is so vivid how he's written it that you could feel you could just imagine being there. I mean, it's it was that kind of writing. Same with the Alaskan wilderness scenes as they get up because he ends up hiking to this bus, and uh, where he's gonna where he's gonna hang out, but. Uh, I often, th- you know, we, we often know a lot of, not we don't know, I don't know if we know people like this, but there are people who feel like, oh, society is is too materialistic and all these things, and I'm just going to pack up and go. And um, I, I never had the desire to just say I'm going to rid myself of every material possession, and I don't know what he thought he was going to do. All right, so I'm so glad you picked this, and I know, and I and, and, and this conversation because I wonder if we get as we get older and we realize how thin the veneer is how things can change on a dime how unimportant some things are like now I look back at someone like the the main character of Into the Wild and I say to myself 
what was the downside of doing what he did? Now, he, I think he, I know how the story ends, but, right. um, but what is the downside of just, you know, putting your stuff in a rucksack and taking your chances, right? You know, I think that part of about it, it's, it's, it's like you say, oh, I'm going to backpack and stay at uh, youth hostels in Europe. Right, you say oh, yeah. okay, I'm going to do that. That's one thing. But he had cut himself off from he essentially dropped out of society, off the grid. So off the grid, no contact with family, um, doesn't stay too much. He, he picks up these odd jobs along the way, but doesn't really give too much information about himself or who he is. And that's what I think the odd part is: is this? Um, so it's not just a desire to to, to explore, explore and, yeah. and and to be kind of like not responsible like in the traditional sense, but this is like, get away. I, I don't want anybody around me. Yeah. He, he was, he was taking, he was leaving. So leaving society, quote unquote, and all the trappings of it, which, well, what happens. <laughs> well, as we get older, we were like, Hmm, something yeah. in that idea. <laughs> and then I noticed that the, the new release this week is right up your alley. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we get a note from deep discount and it's like a grid of, what we're going to be talking about and promoting and uh in, in red it says next to this one this is for you john so thank you lauren uh it's star trek picard season two this is from paramount uh, studios the first season of picard did extremely well brought together some of the memorable cast members from the next generation season two continues that trend introducing some new people and for those who haven't seen it, and I have actually not seen it, so I'm, I'm probably going to pick this up because I don't always subscribe to the streamer services on a regular basis. Like I shut them off for a while, turn them back right. on if I want something. And this would be worth getting on disc for me. Um, one big reason is that uh, they brought back Q. And for all Star Trek The Next Generation fans, Q is an omniscient, omnipotent being that has always bedeviled Picard. And he is a main character in season two, which was very well received. So the new release this week, thank you, Lauren, is Star Trek Picard season two on Blu-ray and DVD. The Blu-ray is $34.99. So there you go, folks. Uh, we want to thank you again uh, for playing last month in the uh, Criterion sale. I want to th give a big thanks to Deep Discount. If you're interested in shopping at their site, and I think you should go there, visit our site, focusgroupradio.com, and click on the Deep Discount logo and start your shopping adventure we're going to take a super quick break and when we return uh, we have a business birthday and shop talk so don't go anywhere we know you're not you're time shifting so we'll be right back you're listening to the focus group with tim and john learn more at focusgroupradio.com Now, back to the focus group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the focus group. Tim Bennett here, as always, with Mr. John T. Nash. Be sure to check us out each week and find all of our media housed at focusgroupradio.com. So, Mr. Nash, our, uh, without further ado, we'll go to our business birthday today. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So this is that time of year we've talked about where it's difficult to find birthdays. This, this, I, <laughs> is this I took, a birthday oasis? <laughs> well, I took a long, long time. So Ray Kroc, who is the founder of McDonald's, which I think we've probably done over the years, Yes. A couple of times. And last year we did Lonnie Johnson, who was uh, a uh, inventor with NASA, who did the super soaker water pistols and stuff. And I thought of doing him again. But as I, I poked around and poked around and poked around. And then I went to some obscure website and came upon Popcorn Sutton. <laughs> and uh, born I love this one. Born October 5th in 1946. I was unaware of old Popcorn. His real name is Marvin. Popcorn Sutton. Did you know anything about him? No. I, I, and the minute I saw the bottle, I'm like, this is classic. So, so tell us about him. So he was born in uh, Maggie Valley, North Carolina. And uh, he's a famous moonshiner and bootlegger. Came from a long family of moonshiners and bootleggers. 
And as he says, uh, he's been arrested many, many times, or he had been arrested many times, and he has very sane logic. So I went and watched some of his. If you're a friend, if you're a fan of Grey Gardens, this would almost be a Grey Gardens of Appalachia. I mean, this would be that sort of, you know, crazy craziness, but not so crazy. So um, <laughs> that's perfectly said. Like, eh, so, yeah. so Marvin, he he would get get arrested all the time by the feds or the state government for making moonshine, and he essentially said. Everybody made moonshine in the South and in Tennessee and North Carolina, whatever, because that's part of their um, culture. Yep. You know, similar to when Jamaicans would say they smoke ganja or whatever, or uh, people, the uh, Eskimos would kill seals or something. He said it's part of our culture. It's what we did. And he said there was never an issue. He said all families had stills and all families made liquor. He says it wasn't until the taxes came. The taxing authorities wanted to tax it. But he would get around these things by going to court and saying, I paid tax on the sugar, I paid tax on the copper, I paid tax on the piping, I paid tax on the light. So he would give all the, he said, so I paid tax on everything already. So you don't have to tax my liquor, which he, L-I-K-K-E-R, liquor. <laughs> so um, <laughs> so anyway, he, he goes and he, he, he wrote a self-published autobiographical, autobiographical guide to moonshining production and then self-produced a home video on how to make uh, moonshine and so forth. And uh, he was a subject of many documentaries and he also, uh, one of them won a regional Emmy of all things. Um, as I said, he thinks it's part of his heritage, heritage as he's Scotch Irish American. He said he descended from a long line of moonshiners. He was given the nickname Popcorn after he uh, got into a frustrated brawl with a bar's faulty popcorn machine and beat the <laughs> hell out of it with a, cool, with a pool cue. So they started calling him Popcorn Sutton because of that, of course, you can imagine. I didn't see that coming. I didn't see the attacking the old machine with the pool cue a mile, million miles away. I didn't see that coming. Yeah. So he's been fr in trouble with the law, they said, several times. He's, he's always, but always avoided uh, prison terms. He was uh, convicted in 74 for selling the untaxed liquor in 81 and 85. Um, but he always, always beat the charges. So when he wrote this, he wrote his biography. Uh, autobiography he said it was called me and my liquor l-i-k-k-e-r <laughs> and he began selling copies in 99 at some junk shop in maggie valley and uh, the new york times called it a rambling obscene and often hilarious account of life in the trade a woman named ernestine upchurch with whom sutton had been living with had helped him write the book uh they also produced a home video at the same time and released a vhs vhs tape he was known as a short, skinny fellow, always wore a hat, and uh, that was his claim to fame. He always wore bib overalls. Every time he would go to court or federal court, he'd always be seen wearing his bib overalls. And uh, he would always go in front of the judge and say, I've run my last run of moonshine. I'm not going to do it anymore. I'm getting too old to do this. And, of course, they'd find hundreds of gallons of moonshine on his property. <laughs> So there was a feature film done, Discovery Channel, the History Channel. Everybody got uh, got involved and discovered him, and uh, he became a bit of this, um, you know, star. Hillbilly, the real story on the History Channel in 07 documentary. 09 PBS won an Emmy um, highlighting him. And he would continue making this moonshine. He was known to have the best moonshine. He would sell it for $100 a gallon wow. out of his old <clears throat> truck. And uh, But it finally caught up to him. So he was diagnosed with cancer at the age of 62 and the, the U.S. government. Uh, he was on a number of, he was on house arrest and again, he was on probation and all kinds of other things. So Tennessee, uh, state of Tennessee and the feds raided his property again and he was convicted. And he was going to have to go to jail. And they originally gave him 24 months and they decided it was going to be 18 months. He said, I'm not going to jail. I'm going to do things on my own terms. So he offed himself. So he ended up, uh, <laughs> he went uh, from, and set, and he had an old Ford Fairmount, an old Ford Green Fairmount that he want, that he traded for um, for three jugs of, of booze. It, it was called, his wife called it the three jug car because he gave three jugs of liquor for it. The daughter, his daughter had come and found him uh, dead in the car with the car still running. And, uh, oh, and a note monoxide. that said, I was, yeah, and a note at carbon monoxide. So, and he essentially said, uh, I was not going to allow um, them to define who I was. I was going to go out on my own terms and no one else's. 
and that's how I was going to die. So the, um, but he did have his own, <laughs> they said his memorial was a spectacle. Hank Williams Jr. showed up, a uh, number of country and Western folks flew in to pay their respects. They said uh, he had a conventional grave marker, but he also had another one, which they called a foot marker. So the, the grave marker said Marvin Popcorn Sutton, ex-moonshiner, and the dates. And the footstone said Popcorn says fuck you. <laughs> was that the footstone? They show it there at the, at the gravesite. And uh, they said he was getting ready for, uh, while, while he was getting ready, <laughs> ready for his death, he had kept a um, casket in his living room sitting there waiting for him and he also had this the epithet on the popcorn said f you on the footstone that was there at the house on the porch as well and uh so after he dies um a number of these country stars hank williams jr they announced a partnership in 2010 with jm concepts and they started distilling and making his recipe dubbed popcorn sutton's tennessee white whiskey and, uh, Not moonshine, though, right? It's actual whiskey now. White okay. whiskey. Well, you understand. <laughs> and uh, so he had given the recipe to uh, someone he had entrusted, and they they had uh, they had started making this stuff. And they said at the launch, everybody from Martina McBride, Travis Tritt, Tanya Tucker, Zach Brown, Little Big Town, um, all kinds of country stars were there for the launch of this. Sold quite well for a while, so that was launched in 2010. But in 2013, Jack Daniels jumped on and said, you're confusing people. They're thinking they're buying Jack Daniels because the bottles look the same. So there was a big lawsuit. They ended up having an undisclosed settlement, and uh, they had to change the look of the bottle. They ended up selling in 2014, selling the uh, popcorn Sutton distilling to a, another company. I'm sorry, 2016, they ended up selling it to the Zazerac company. And they're still deciding whether they're going to continue making popcorn Sutton brands or not. I went to look to see if we could buy a bottle. And you online. can't. You can buy it on eBay. It's a fortune. You know, so Ooh, some of the older okay. bottles. So it's like someone bought it and held it. Okay. Right. But uh, some of the newer stuff that was in the clear bottle that didn't look like the uh, the, uh, the Jack Daniels bottle. Jack Daniels bottle. Um, hard to find. But so somebody else owns, or Zazerac Company owns the uh, recipe now and the distilling and the names. But they're deciding what they're going to do with it. So that's our uh, business birthday. He made a, made, a, made a living selling moonshine out of the back of his truck for his whole life. And uh, you'll have to go check out some of the YouTube clips and videos. and it'll just Of Popcorn Sutton. Popcorn Sutton. And fill you right in on what's going on. This has to be... This is a unique business birthday, right? Mm. <clears throat> totally unique. And I, I'm glad... I don't know... You must have just, like, read about this and just died laughing, right? Well, there were all these... You know, as I said, Ray Kroc and some of these other yep. people. And then there was a Paris Hilton sister, and she married a Rothschild. I thought, oh, that's kind of boring. <laughs> but then I saw this popcorn Sutton and the guy there with the, you know, with the cigarette and the hat and the whole deal. Uh -huh. Who the hell a is character. Pop yeah, who's popcorn Central casting Sutton? sent him directly to you. you yeah. Know? So that's our happy birthday popcorn, although he died an early death. Yes. But uh, on his own terms. Mm-hmm. So, but I think that would be a fun one to... Uh, to watch i think you'd probably get a hoot out of it i uh, trust me <laughs> and bob's gonna love this one too <laughs> yeah so uh we mentioned earlier i mentioned uh in our tease at the beginning of the show steve jobs and uh john had found a shop talk and the headline is i worked at apple for 10 years here's what steve jobs taught me about how to be successful at anything in life and uh, there was a guy who was an engineer at Apple, and uh, from 2003 to 2013, he was part of the teams that helped build uh, FaceTime, iMessage, CarPlay. And uh, he had said he worked closely with Steve Jobs. I don't know if they gave his name. I didn't, I didn't see his name here, but it just says he got to work close with Steve Jobs. And he said it was an opportunity to never forget, and that Jobs was a visionary. He taught him a lot about how to make products that people love and how to essentially be successful in anything in life, and gives three very simple yet profound lessons that he learned, which we'll share with you today. And uh, I had a thought about this at the very end that I'll save and um, see if you felt the same. I wonder way, if, yeah, same way about this. But what was the first? What was the first uh, lesson learned? First lesson is that mastery of anything demands iteration. The idea that things evolve over time. So you can create something, but the ultimate product may not exactly be what you 
envision until later on. Getting something right requires patience and hard work, but it also means knowing when to stop making changes. You'll know when you've arrived at the best product when you're beyond excited to share it. Uh, during my first week, at, this is the author of this piece. During my first week at Apple, Jobs was prepping for an iChat demo. I'm going to make the crowd sh their pants, he said. We're going to make them shit their pants. Jobs knew he had executed something great with iChat. So, uh, lesson number one: again, uh, mastery demands iteration. You know, constant evolving. Right. What is our second one here? So number two is use your failures as a stepping or as stepping stones to success. So use your failures as stepping stones to success. They said when um, when Apple was ready to release the iPhone into the world, the foundation was already there, making it possible to keep taking new and different risks later on. With every product, Jobs expected things to go wrong, but he also understood that messing up was often worth the reward. Perfection may not exist, but greatness could be achieved with a few software updates. I think that frustrates people. <laughs> uh, you read my mind. Um, the early iPhone did, in fact, frustrate a lot of its early adopters. It was only on one network, if many you recall. It was only on AT&T, yeah. as I recall, which was not one of the best in the country. I mean, no. I you can argue that, but um, everybody desperately wanted it to be on Verizon, who was still very locked at the hip with... Um, blackberry as yeah <laughs> not that long ago we were all pushing little buttons i used to like the blackberry a great deal the third lesson um is this remove that rock if you want to grow beyond your comfort zone and there's a little picture they show here of a of a tree on the right and there's apples or pears falling it and those are the results and in the left there's a doing things the old way so you have to get by that rock to get to the new way and the explanation here for that is in the article the original iPhone changed the world forever in 2007, and boy, did it ever. I don't think he ever foresaw what these little gray rec these little electronic rectangles right. were going to do to our society with its multi-touch screen and digital keyboard as highlights. The decision to remove the mechanical keyboard was a clever industrial design solution. It allowed the iPhone to have more screen space for other creative features. Um, so that's basically their way of saying... You know, if something's in your way, like the physical keyboard, and I'm sure that um, many, many, many engineers were like, okay, you can't get rid of it. Everybody loves these things. And they're like, well, maybe we can. Let's see what happens. Right. That's In this case with Apple, that's what they were getting at with this. So my, what's your overall thought on this piece? Did you have an overall thought? Um, yeah, I did. And, and the, my overall thought was, is this new? Like... If you if you talk to industrial designers or artists, even just an artist like a painter or a sculptor, iteration was always part of the of the. You you learned that you were never going to arrive at perfection unless you you purpose you made mistakes along the way to what your right. goal was. Um, and and so I think that maybe Steve Jobs was just really good at encapsulating stuff that we already knew and putting it into certain, like little sound bites and everybody's like, oh, this is brilliant. But I thought this was the way we kind of got to for me to be anyway. Yeah, and I, I I'm glad you brought that up because I'm not sure I I took it to that um, more general level about that as well as just that, you know these are the steps to success. The one thing I've found is because we see a lot of stories, there's always stories about Steve Jobs. And I was just wondering, is a lot of this job adulation 2020 hindsight? Mm. In other words, oh, um, all of a sudden he becomes brilliant because there was success of something. But is that 2020 hindsight and you make it, you go backwards from the success of it and how it fit? I, I just wondered if that was part of this as well. Or do you not see it that way? I think I think it's both. Actually, yeah. <clears throat> I think I think both points of view are are dead on with this because um, a lot of things that Apple did there there you you can go back and look at some of the decisions they've made and some of them haven't aged very well and some look surprisingly brilliant. But I'm sure that when they were made, it was for a certain kind of environment they were made in. So it's, I think it's six of one as as a, yeah. a, a here's a little idiom six of one half, half dozen of another. Yeah. I, remember, I said that to a French friend of mine once. He goes, they're the same thing. I'm like, uh -huh, it's that's a, a point. Idiom, yeah. <laughs> the, um, so do you, so you have the Apple watch. 
Yes. And are you using it or do you find, because I, I, at least my impression is um, that that may, might not have done as well as they would have hoped. So I have now I could become, be wrong. I've now become the person who asks someone who wears an Apple Watch if they use it on a consistent basis and if they enjoy it. You will be, sh- the last four people I spoke with, I was at the gym one day and I saw that I was changing next to this guy. I said, I said, do you use that? Do you use the watch a lot? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, then he said this. He goes, I would not have bought it for myself. It was a gift. Mm-hmm. Okay. And he goes, and my big complaint is that you got to charge it every night. Okay. So then I, fast forward, I'm at the grocery store, the grocery store. And then a high school checkout girl who's really sweet, she's ringing me up and she has a watch on. I said, do you like the watch? Uh, it was a gift. And, you know, I'll tell you this. It's great for when the teacher confiscates your phone because you can still <laughs> send text messages on the watch. You know, kids are kids. And then last but all, just my last How example. How can you do that? Can mine. you type on that thing? Yes, you can. That and little you have to have... Yes, it's a tiny little key, oh chick gosh. keyboard. I don't know how they do it, the kids, right? And then um, a friend of mine who's a yoga instructor had one. She went out to do a retreat at Yos. No, she was at Bryce or Zion. She was at Zion National Park. She said one day the watch ran out of charge, and she just didn't bother charging it, and she hasn't charged it since. And, wow. and she just feels like she doesn't need something on her wrist that tells her things besides the time. And... I'm falling into that category, so I had the watch with me when we went up to Cape Cod um, for a trip last week, and I thought, oh, I'll, I'll track my bike ride. I was going to do like a 40-mile ride up to Brewster and back. Watch was dead. <laughs> really? <laughs> Why? don't charge it. And so no. I thought, do I want to wait and charge? I thought, no, I don't need the data from this. I get the data from my cycling computer. And so I've had a mixed experience with it. Um, Mostly I use it to tell time, which I could do with my mechanical watch just fine. And I find that the connected features, if you're carrying a phone around, it's redundant. I, I, Tim, I guess it proves, like you've always said, like, you know, this is the one thing you don't have that Apple makes. And I used to always push back and say, well, you know, if I ever found a need for it, it sort of proves my point of view that it's, it's, there are people who love it. Right. Like I ran into someone who said, you don't have it set up right. You, you should be tracking how many steps a day you take. For example, it, take, it tests your blood oxygen level. I guess I that's good. That. To, it has a sensor, and my, my blood oxygen level is usually 98%. Sometimes it's 97. Uh, it does your heart rate and EKG, and my heart rate and the EKG indicate that I have something called a sinus rhythm, which is a normal heart rate. And when I mention this to people, they all shrug. They're like, well, I guess it's good to know uh, what our oxygen rate is in our EKG. <laughs> but now, can you, know, you make a call on that? on that? Yes, you can. If you had the cellular version, the watch that I was given is only, it's tied to the phone. So you could speak through the watch, but you have to have the phone available. If you had okay. the cellular only, you could in fact make a call on the watch. So I, yeah. I guess that's the, the difference. If you bought one that had the capabilities to be a cell device, um, and that's what I've heard from others that once you unchain it from the phone, it's liberating because you could just leave the house without your phone. But I, mm. there's a couple of friends here that have them, and when they go off, they're you know they're doing the let me look yep. at it, let me look at it. No different than picking up your phone, I guess, and looking at it. Maybe it's not as obtrusive, but I um I always thought it was more uh, particularly when the people got the Hermes straps or something, it was more of a status symbol. Oh yeah, you know yeah. more than anything else, but. I was wondering whether you liked it or not or how it was working out um, because I used to love the i, the uh, iPod, which they stopped making oh. because I guess everybody could put their music on, on, the, the, phone. on the phone. But but I, I still like the iPod, but I guess I was a dinosaur in that. No, regard. you weren't. Um, in fact, I think a couple of weeks from now, we're going to have a, a show specifically on music. And one of the things that I think is fascinating is our listening capabilities changed how we approach music. And when we used to have CD Walkmans, right? You'd have the whole CD. You'd still have to hear the album. Yeah. And it wasn't, when it was a, a Walkman with cassette tapes, it was either a whole album or a mixtape. Now you could listen song by song. Do you remember the um, Apple Shuffle? It was a little, it looked yeah. like a little USB. That was my old business partner, Greg's absolute favorite device for music. Yeah. It could only you hold could a certain it. numbers. Yep. Yeah, clip, clip, clip it, it on something, it weighed I nothing. Love that too. And he could just load it with a bunch of music he never listened to, and it would rotate, and he'd hear songs he hadn't heard in 10 years. He'd wipe it, put more music on, yep. and perfect device. I still have I still have mine. I don't know if it's usable. 
the um I, good i'm glad you brought this up because i have with my move i have three crates of cds yeah. discs so as i said the vinyl sold you know at a fire sale rate richard but um yeah i probably anyway that's gone but now i that have boat sailed <laughs> but now he wants me to get rid of all of these because we have three you know in the bathtub downstairs three of these crates of of cds cds music and i and i'm thinking okay we spent probably was it 15 dollars a cd 12 dollars my CD. god yeah did you would it, have you do you still have your cds yeah we do so what we did though um was we bought a bunch of these thin plastic sleeves that have a one side's like a coating right. that's soft and the other is just clear plastic and one side and then the flip side can hold um the booklet from the cd the jewel case the jewel cases are really what takes up the space. Right. So what we decided to do is we digitized our favorite CDs. And back when we did this, it took forever to do this. Now you right. could buy like a little CD-ROM drive, plug it in. I think you could digitize a disc in, in less than five minutes. Um, made sure all the tracks translated, labeled it correctly, and put it in the library. The problem with that is that once we digitized everything, we stopped listening to the music. Well, because you, you can't see it. <laughs> exactly. We couldn't pick it up and... Like there's an album that we refuse to digitize. It's Abracadabra. It's the uh, yeah, Ab that. Abba covers with that yeah. little helicopter on the front. And so you can do that. And then you're just going to get rid of all the physical packaging. You might still save the disc or get rid of them all. And then you just have this all digitized and you better hope. Well, you know, by the time we got to this, this land of CDs, you needed an encoding and decoding device to listen anyway. At least vinyl had the ability. You could look at it. You knew what the needle did. Right. Blah blah blah, but yeah. well, my concern was you. You had downloaded. You would help me when I got the new computer and downloaded all that music to a hard drive. Not all of it translated over, but I would say ninety nine point nine percent. Yeah. But I said, you know, okay, if I got rid of all of these discs, um, what if eventually whatever I downloaded on that hard drive is not compatible with whatever else is next, right? I mean, would that translate, would that always translate over on that hard drive or? I think MP3s and WAV files will always be playable. It's kind of like I a PDF. So. It became a standard. Yeah. But you, you bring up a great point. Like, um, I recently repurchased a bunch of albums that iTunes had listed as remastered. Right. And I listened to the CD the CD version and the remastered version. The remastered really sparkles. It's like they went back to the the master tracks and they created some really good new mixes. And it reminded me that we've been paying for a lot of the same stuff over and, and over, over and, and over. over. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you how many B fifty two right. How many copies you have of Rock Lobsters back yeah. in nineteen seventy four or seventy six or whatever seventy eight? Yeah. Yeah, I so said the same go. thing. I bought it as an album. I bought it as a cassette. I bought it as, I bought a, CD. as a CD. <laughs> no, no. And then I bought it as a remastered, <laughs> a remastered iTunes thing. And then so I'm paying I, SoundCloud or whatever, a monthly fee to, or Amazon. Anyway, you're getting screwed with music again. Yeah. It's like that with movies, too. Yeah. Anyway, folks, we want to thank you for joining us today here on the Focus Group. A big thanks to Deep Discount. You could get to their site by going to rsfocusgroupradio.com and clicking on the shark logo, which is Sharky the Shark. And you can check out the new films. Uh, so the new release this week is Picard, Season 2 from Paramount Networks. And uh, we also had films. We featured films from biographies uh, or biographical films is the thing this week. And Tim picked Into the Wild, right? Yep. And mine was um, Rust, or Scotty, which is about, uh, let me just make sure there's Scotty and the Secret History of Hollywood on DVD. That's Scotty Bowers who sold many favors from a gas station in Hollywood, including himself. So uh, thanks to everybody. And we want to remind people, let me get this up here, because I have seen this. Mm, boy, have I seen a lot of this lately. Don't text and drive. Please arrive alive. I can't tell you how often I've seen a car swerving, and I go by mm -hmm. it, and there's someone with a phone on the steering wheel. And you're like, what are you doing? Idiots. Please be safe, and we'll see you in the new week. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.